add lemon. Recipes you want to cook with, food you want to eat. Always Add Lemon is the highly anticipated first book from the American-born Danielle Alvarez, one of the most exciting young chefs cooking in Australia today. Born to a food-loving Cuban family in Miami, the lure of the kitchen took her to California to work with some of America's finest, including the French Laundry. She moved to Sydney, Australia in 2016 when the Maryvale Group asked her to head up the kitchen in their strikingly beautiful new restaurant, Fred's. She and the restaurant won fast acclaim and continue to be rated among the best in the country. Taking the lessons, skills, and tastes acquired working alongside some of the best chefs in America, Danielle translates formidable kitchen smarts into an inspiring collection of recipes and projects for nourishing, vegetable-forward, and seasonal food. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are joined by Carlos Frias. He is a 2018 James Beard Award winner, the food and dining editor of the Miami Herald, and a good friend of Books and Books. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you are invited to ask questions by asking the or by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after the talk. Uh, you can find Always Add Lemon for purchase at Books and Books by pressing the green button below, and you can also use the Donate button to support us, and any amount is welcome. Indie bookstores really need your help right now more than ever, so we really appreciate it. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests onto the stage. Hello. Hello, Danielle. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Carlos. Well, it's so great to see you and to be able to be here and, and talk about your great new book, but also to talk, to let Miami know a little bit about you. Thank so you. This is great. It's good to be here. Yeah. So, Danielle, um, you know, we, we heard a little bit about you, but and we were just chatting before we got started about your background and how most of your career really is based on the West Coast and down under. Uh, your lighting looks so good right now because it is daytime <laughs> in Australia. And I've got us, that morning glow. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what it's like in the future. <laughs> well, it's the same. <laughs> same problems, but no, we're, we're doing good. We're a day ahead, so it's about um, 11 in the morning over here now. Okay. Well, Danielle, I guess let's let's start at the beginning, as the saying goes. Um, uh, you are you're Miami born to Cuban parents. Yep. So, so tell, tell, tell us a little bit about growing up in my, like what it, what was your Miami experience growing up? Well, I think like a lot of um, children of Cuban parents, I grew up with a lot of beautiful food around. You too, you get it. Um, but you know, big family. My mom cooked so much. Uh, she cooked for the whole family to come over. I had um, two grandmothers that um, cooked beautiful food as well. So it was a lot of like family gatherings. We, you know, we lived in the same house that um, uh, my whole childhood. I went to, uh, to school in Coconut Grove and um, I, I just have so many fond memories of growing up in Miami. It was, it was amazing. So tell me about that. Where, where'd you go to, where'd you go to school? I went to Carrollton. School of Sacred okay. Hearts, shout out. I hope that anyone from there is watching. All right. um, but I went there from like kindergarten all the way to, to 12th grade. So I was there for a really long time. I, it was an amazing school, a great experience. So uh, you you mentioned, um, where, was your family in Coconut Grove or where, where was your family? No, so, so my mom is still, uh, my parents are still living near Brickell and like the Rhodes area. So I think they should be watching now. Um, so hello to them. Um, okay. So they're still in the same house, yeah. So when, you, when you're raised in Miami, what are some of the things that you took for granted? What are some of the things that it, you didn't realize made Miami special until you got out of the, the Miami bubble, as we like to call it lovingly? Well, I really miss um, all kinds of Latin culture. I mean, in, a, in Sydney, if I hear someone speaking Spanish, my ears just perk up because I hear it so rarely. But I really miss that, like, you know, the energy that, uh, especially Cubans, I mean, I grew up around Cuban people, but now I know Miami so diverse with so many different Latin cultures, but the energy of that, the flavors that you get in the in Latin cooking, um, I, I probably miss that the most, aside from the people. <laughs> uh, Sydney, I found interesting, I was, we were talking earlier, I was in Sydney exactly these weeks, uh, this time last year, in that little break between the fire, between the fires that that were such a scary time for you guys mm -hmm. um, I, I what i found that was interesting about sydney is that it was 
it, in the same way that Miami is kind of this gateway between Latin America and and the rest of the of what is the, the rest of the Americas, um, I found that Sydney was a little bit of like a like a gateway to to Oceania. You know, the yeah. kind of like the, the it's like this meeting place of Western and Eastern cultures that I found so interesting. What what has that experience been like for you, where it's it's so different from your background? Well, one of the things that like drew me to cooking in Australia was I knew I was going to get exposed to a lot more Asian ingredients and Asian cooking techniques um, and, and doing it in a country where I spoke the language. So that was really appealing. And and it certainly has delivered on that. Like there's a lot of subtle differences, culturally speaking. I mean, it's it's pretty easy to go from living in the U.S. to living here. It's a great country. Um, but um there's a lot of little differences. And, and whereas like in South Florida, you you know, a lot of the restaurants would be like Latin flavored here. Everyone goes for Thai and Chinese and Japanese and all kinds of food like that. So I've really got to experience a lot of that and taste things that I might have not tasted um, back home. Well, it's funny because that gets me thinking about the title of your cookbook, Always Add Lemon which is such a, such a thing that you would grow up specifically in a Cuban household, um, you know, finding those, those green Persian limes, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and in, you know, in, in Thai cooking and in Asian cooking, that, that acid flavor is so important uh, also. Um, it, have, tell me about a little bit about how you've, you know, connected those two parts of your, your present day and your background. Yeah, well, actually, I tell this, I tell a story in the book for, I have a recipe for a lime curd tart. Um, it's a little bit like a key lime pie, but not exactly. Um, and and I, I remember being a kid and we had a beautiful lime tree in the backyard. And I remember like my mom saying, you know, why don't you go out and get like one lime, bring it back in. And we'd squeeze it all over everything, whether it was like ropa vieja or, you know, any, any of the stews or anything. And um, I think that's where my love of that like bright acidity to finish things started. Um, of course, my cooking professionally led me into cooking that was a bit more Italian or French or you know Spanish even. And so lemon is kind of the thing that I turn to more now. But I I totally agree with you. I think that's where it all started for me. So tell me about that. Your your career in cooking was never really in South Florida. How did you? How did you get into cooking? What was the what was the thing that really uh, made you feel like this was going to be the arc of your career? Well, I never, I definitely didn't plan it. I went to the University of Florida and I studied art history, um, and I thought maybe I'd go into that world. And when I started in that, um, I kind of quickly realized that it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. I I missed doing something with my hands. I, I was always thinking about cooking on my days off, on my nights off, and I thought you know, it was really on a whim because no one in my family ever worked in hospitality professionally. So I enrolled in culinary school in South Florida. And then it was, I applied for an internship at the French Laundry, which is, you know, as you know, really what world renowned restaurant. So I could not believe when they said yes to me. Um, and so it's I like applying, I, it's, it's like applying crazy. for Harvard, basically. Once it's, you graduate, yeah. it's like it's applying for Harvard graduate school, basically. It's applying to Harvard without having with having terrible grades. So <laughs> I had I had no experience. Um, so I anyways, they gave me a shot, though, right? Like it's an unpaid internship. So um, I went and I did that for several months and then ended up getting a job there and stayed for close to two years. And and that was an incredibly formative time for me. Like I. I realized that I didn't really want to work in that style of kitchen. The food that I was more drawn to was a little bit more, how would you say, like soulful. Um, but I got the experience there of, you know, working in a professional kitchen, number one, but seeing where fresh produce grew, like right across the street from the restaurant, they had an incredible garden. There were lots of different farms in the Napa Valley that supplied the restaurant. And you could really taste and see the difference. And I loved getting to meet all those different people and to see where the food that we were cooking and eating was coming from. So, so that kind of really was the start of it for me. So I'm curious because I'm also a University of Florida grad. And, ah, right. and, go, go and, Gators. Yeah, go Gators. 
So I'm curious what your dorm life was like and whether you were always cooking. What was your oh what was God. your situation like? Did you have people were you cooking for people? Were you cooking for yourself? What was that part of no. your college well, experience? Definitely not in the dorm where I had like one microwave. I, I think my my dorm life was was short lived. I was only in the dorms for the first year and <laughs> and then got an apartment with friends. Um and and I think in that time, I can remember having like several things where friends would come over and I was just naturally the one that wanted to do the cooking. Um, so again, like if I look back at my life and how that kind of grew in me, that desire to cook professionally, I could see how, you know, from childhood watching my mom do it and then growing up and being in my own home or space and wanting to do that for my friends, like it all kind of progressed. And of course, the, the change from like cooking for friends and family to cooking professionally is very, very different. But luckily, I, I really enjoy it. And I love restaurants and the energy and the buzz and the adrenaline and all that stuff. So, so it worked out for me. Well, what was your experience like growing up as far as cooking? Who, who in your house was the cook? Uh, what, what were some of the dishes that, th that that person still has to make for you when you come home? My, my mom, hands down, I think she's one of the greatest cooks. I, and she like the food that she cooks, you can just like taste the love in it but she is very well known for her black beans i think they're the best um her afro As, that's a, that's the right answer for a cuban daughter <laughs> yeah. that is the correct answer the black bean the arroz con pollo <laughs> like you know everything she makes is amazing but a, a lot of those cuban staples i don't even attempt them because they just never taste exactly the same so uh when i go home that's like the first thing that she makes which is great i love it so you get to New York, uh, to I'm sorry, to um, the West Coast, and you're in California, and you have this. Yeah. You were at, you were at two of really the most iconic restaurants, two of the most iconic restaurants in the world. Uh, for folks who might know, uh, Chez Panisse is another one of those restaurants that really started the farm to table movement. I guess you could say, in the sense that yeah. Yeah. Uh, she was really tapping into local ingredients. It's something that we're seeing a lot now in in South Florida. Um, how did that How did that shape your ideas about um, what cooking should be, because uh, it sounds like you you found something there that you didn't quite uh, that didn't quite mesh with what you wanted to continue doing. Uh, yeah, I, like French, French I think Ch Chez Panisse really just connected all the dots for me. And and as you say, like it is, you know, world renowned. It's um, Chez Panisse is almost fifty years old, you know, so it's been around for a long time. And Alice. Waters, the you know the owner and founder, she she was an inspiration to me. I mean, you know, being a woman, obviously, but she the whole community of people that surround that restaurant was really impressive. Like she had a philosophy around not just hiring chefs. You know, she wanted to employ artists and thinkers and intellectuals and people that um, had a point of view on certain things. Um, so that restaurant was incredibly exciting for me to be in. We cook something different every day. It was absolutely the best produce that you'd find anywhere really, but especially in Northern California. And that's like, you know, the center of where a lot of our produce or the produce in the US comes from. So, so we got to use the most incredible product. I've worked with great people, like some of the nicest people I've ever worked with. And, and they all knew how to cook beautiful, delicious food that was, you know, it was fresh. It was, I learned about vegetables and fruits and vegetables in a way that I'd never experienced. Like, I'm so happy to hear that Miami has a bit more of that. But when I was young, you know, like a farmer's market was rare. And, you know, using all these different vegetables that I was exposed to, I had really never seen them before. I didn't know how to cook with them. So I learned a lot. I learned a lot quickly. And um, it's, it's totally formed who I am as a chef moving on from that. What was what was uh, give us an example of coming across a, a vegetable that you had no that you had no experience with? Well, I mean, something simple, just even like like greens, you know, um, Swiss chard, rainbow chard, all those kinds of things. I, yeah, in a Cuban family, greens greens are the equivalent of that of a of a, a Boston lettuce salad, basically. Yeah, right? iceberg, exactly. iceberg lettuce with some slices oh, of tomato and that's maybe right, some I, carrots actually, in there. I actually said that in the book because that was my idea of the salad. And then when I got to Chez Panisse and we would talk about the salads, and of course I'd been in California a few years, so I started to kind of evolve my thinking. But, you know, the salads were like, 
um, some blanched green beans with freshly shelled port latte beans, which, you know, a girl who grew up eating dried beans all her life to see a fresh bean in the pod was really, it was really interesting for me. And I, I loved how it cooked differently and how it tasted differently. And um, yeah, so something like greens, for example, how you could just saute it or saute it down and mix it into a pasta like that was all stuff that was really new to me and you know now i think oh my god i cook like that all the time but at the time it was really it was really amazing for me to see all that it's funny because you mentioned that your your um your food is vegetable forward is uh, something that, uh, that uh, the moderator kind of introduced and the idea of a vegetable forward eating cuban girl from miami is uh it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's not something it that doesn't make sense all right How nowadays things are changing that way but yeah uh, <laughs> so we, we, you naturally had to have had an open um an open mind and a palate for that uh who do you what do you think was the reason behind that like why because you know a lot I of think- kids just eat their there's Cuban staples. What what helped? No, totally. You and and out? I wasn't. I don't think I was an adventurous um, eater as a kid. I mean, I'm sure my mom would say that we weren't. We were basic. We ate what we liked. But my grandmother, my mom's mom, was she was an incredible cook. And I used to listen to the stories that she would tell us about growing up in Cuba and how she taught um, other people in the family how to make certain things. And I remember she looked after me because my mom worked when I was young. And I remember like one day in particular that um, I think we were watching, I don't know if you remember those old shows where they'd show like the, the hotel chefs with the big toe hats. Oh um, yeah, sure. Making all those very fancy hotel dishes. And I think one of the guys made crepes or something simple like that. And, and the show ended and she was like, well, let's go make them. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Like you can make that? I, I was like, only chefs can make that. And and she just whipped it up and it was delicious. And she, you know, I think she was, she always cooked incredible Cuban food, but she could always throw in these like classic French dishes, which I think was very much the style of like what you cooked in Cuba at that time. So I, I was so impressed by her. I think looking back on it, that definitely opened my eyes up to other possibilities, um, even if I wasn't eating that way as a kid at the time. Uh, what what was her what is her name and is she still living? Her name is Aida Camafreita. No, she's not. She passed away a couple of years ago. But oh, um, there's a photo of her in the book, a really beautiful photo of her. Um, I think my mom said it was her her quinceañera photo. Anyway, she's gorgeous. And and so that that must be an interesting thing because not every kid had that experience where you have the one person in your family not just that cooks, but that is adventurous about the cooking. You know the the yeah. saying, hey, we can make. X, Y, Z. I mean, I don't think a lot of Cuban households had uh, French crepes, you know, on a, <laughs> on a random Sunday. I know. Sunday. Well, I mean, I think I, I really respected her for that and I loved it. And then funnily enough, I think I saw my mom as I grew up also doing the same thing. You know, when we were young, it was everyone was busy. She was working, three kids. Like it was just about getting dinner on the table. But then as we got older, you know, she started to cook a few more different things and, and, everything tasted amazing so obviously she's a natural talent uh i'm i'm seeing here a comment that the paloma sisters were fierce in the kitchen (laughs) that's from my cousin (laughs) so that's my grandmother she's ida palomo is her maiden name um and then my cousin tina's um grandmother was her sister so it was five sisters and uh they all knew how to cook and my grandmother was the youngest one of them all so i think she was um she was also extra feisty, my grandmother. I remember her as. <laughs> and and so, you you come from this this background. And you were telling your your folks worked a lot. What what did your parents do for a living? My dad's a banker and still working to this day. Although I tell him he's got to stop. Daddy, you have to retire. <laughs> and um and my mom is not working now, but um she she had office jobs um growing up and and still has worked um on and off for the past several years. I think. She likes to keep busy. I think this time being at home for everyone has been driving them all a bit crazy. Yeah, I can imagine. So yeah. you, did, your, did your grandmother grow up in your household with you? Uh, no, basketball? she didn't. No. Um, so we grew up, uh, my parents, my, my sister and my brother, and my grandparents lived close by. So this is like 
the other way of not living totally together. But my grandparents were like five blocks that way. My dad's parents were five blocks in the other direction. So everyone was really, really close. Um, although not living in the Punto, same pero no revuelto is the same. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So you have this kind of um, this this background of this interest, and you go you uh, where did you go to culinary school? Was it Johnson Wales Johnson down here? Johnson Wales, yeah. Okay. Which is so closed, hasn't it? I heard it. It closed. Yeah. Uh, it closed this year. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it was uh, a real bummer because so many great chefs. I mean, Michelle yeah. Bernstein was in the first class. Well. Do you know what? It's so funny that you say that because she came and spoke to my class when I was there. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, she's so amazing. It's so cool to meet her. And she brought us like foie gras with strawberries, which I think was a dish that she was quite famous for at the time. And I just remember idolizing her and thinking she was so impressive. And now to think that like I became a chef and, um, you know, I, thinking back on that time, it's really amazing. Yeah. So, you know, the, the life kind of takes you out to the West Coast and then, but it's a big jump, uh, both figuratively uh, and literally <laughs> yeah. to get to Australia. What, what, yeah. what, how did that turn out? Like, how did that happen? How did that come about? So, I, I mean, this is one of those like twists of fate and moments that life can throw at you where you either say yes and you go for it or you don't and it probably never comes around again. I, I was leaving California. I had a friend who uh, was an Australian guy, but worked with me at Chez Panisse. He was sort of Alice's right-hand man. Um, and I came here for a vacation and I loved Sydney. I thought the food scene was amazing. Um, and I thought, I really want to get back here, but I never made like a plan to move here or anything. I, I kind of, you know, you can imagine the, the fear I had telling my Cuban parents that I wanted to move to Australia. That was like, what? Um, but he put me in touch with a company called Maryville, which owns the restaurant that I now, um, operate in Sydney. And, um, he said, they're looking for someone to head up a restaurant and, and be a part of the design process and really build the concept, um, with food, the style of Chez Panisse. And it was just happened to be at a time where I was ready to say yes to things. And I came out and, um, I really loved the team. They really understood what I was saying, and, and I loved, the, you know, they build beautiful restaurants. If you've seen photos of Fred's, I think it is one of the most beautiful restaurants in the world. I feel really lucky that I get to cook there every day. Um, so then I, I made the big jump, and I moved over, and it, it took about two years for it to actually open. Um, but in that time, I got to connect with different farms in Sydney, because you come to a country like this, a foreign country, you have to start from zero in terms of building those relationships with the farmers that are going to supply the restaurant. A lot of these people, you can't just, you know, rock up and say, hey, will you sell to me? You have to like earn their trust. They have to respect you. They have to know that you're going to do justice to what they've worked so hard to grow. So that two years was really important in forming a lot of those relationships. And then we opened um, four years ago. So you had basic, so what you're saying is you didn't have a lot going on, so you decided to write a cookbook. <laughs> yeah, I was basically <laughs> doing nothing. No, um, yeah. So. And, and we should and we should show the cookbook, which uh, y'all yeah, can see over there. Too, it's uh, <laughs> always add lemons. A beautiful. Yes. It's actually a beautiful book with some some just like just like really beautiful photography. Oh, it doesn't it you. doesn't the, the video doesn't do it justice, but um, yeah. So tell me about, you know, so you, you were at that restaurant for four years and you have all these kind of s major stepping stone experiences. Yeah. So what did you want this book to be? You know, everybody tries to tie together some idea about their book. What is it that you wanted to say with it? Well, I think more than anything, this book is like a culmination of all of those big stepping stones in my life. There's a few little hints of my childhood and some of those flavors. There's a lot that I learned about in California. And then there's also so much that I learned about in Sydney and Australia that incorporates more of those Asian ingredients. But all of it does center around fresh seasonal produce, which, you know, as I, as I think I said earlier, really became the thing that made me realize how amazing and community building food can be. 
Um, so it's a lot of recipes, it's a lot of stories, but it's also a lot of just little droplets of knowledge that I picked up over the years that I have never really read anywhere else. Like, I think a lot of people, you know, write beautiful recipes, but kind of fail to leave out that last step of try to look for this or imagine that this is what you're aiming for. I, I think as a young chef, when I worked somewhere like Chez Panisse, where there were no recipes and every day was different, I had to be able to imagine what I was trying to make um, and then find my way to get there. So the recipes that I write are very much written that way, but I try to give you as many concrete steps as possible so you can feel comfortable and confident. And and that's that's a, a trick because um, from experience, when you get a recipe from a chef, sometimes they are uh, they're impenetrable. You know, they're yeah. forty nine steps. You know, I they know. require and they might require you know an immersion blender. They might require yeah. a you know a sous vide machine. Um, yeah. So, tell me about how you tried to keep like like your mom or your you know yeah. your grandma got rest her soul in mind. Like yeah. for folks who you know who would be doing this in the and they're not sophisticated kitchens. Well, all the recipes were written and tested in my home kitchen. So there is not a whole lot of fancy tools or ingredients used. I think, you know, there's some there's some dishes that might be a little bit more intimidating because you've not heard of that ingredient or you don't know where to find that. Like a couple of, you know, Japanese ingredients, I would say come to mind first. But if you got the ingredients, I think you'd be really impressed to try something a little bit new and different. And I hope that some of the simpler recipes will encourage you to try more of the complex recipes. Because uh, to me, that's what food should be, a little bit of like discovery. And because we can't travel these days, it's it's kind of a, an escape in a way when you can make something that tastes like a, um, you know, a, a very traditional ponzu sauce from Japan, but you can make that in your own kitchen. So I'd like to share a bit of that, also a bit of the basics. So there should be something for everyone. Yeah, that kind of dovetails into, you know, this idea of, you know, folks who are going to buy a cookbook usually have other cookbooks, right? Like it, they yeah. add it. It's like a, it's like buying a new uh, kitchen equipment, you know, like a, yeah. Well, you can uh, see behind me, I've got several. <laughs> I was noticed. I was noticing some books you have there called Bestia, which yeah. you probably has a different different context if you're uh, <laughs> if you're Cuban. If you're uh, Cuban, <laughs> yeah. So how do you want people to use your book? And in what way do you think? Is it like for a special meal, like for a weekend? Is it are there recipes that you can use daily? What how do you want people to use it? Well, I think most of the recipes are a bit more of those special dishes. I think there's definitely some that could be um, you know, your average weekday meal. But I, I really what I really want and what I have seen a lot of people doing and things that they've told me is that they said they've read it cover to cover, which I think is really interesting because cookbooks don't often get read that way. I mean, I read cookbooks that way, but I don't really think a lot of people do. And and I think that that's cool because I do drop in a lot of information into those recipe introductions. And it's a lot of storytelling about how some recipes originate, not just because I wrote them, because they're classic recipes and you, know, you should know where they came from. So, um, I think it's a bit of both. I think you could definitely open it up on a Wednesday and make your dinner, or you could open it up and bookmark some recipes that you wanna make something special for your family, or if you're having friends over for your friends. Mm. I'm also curious about those intros because you know we as a society have gotten so used to going to a handful of resources. I know I do on a handful of resources all on the internet, you know, yeah. whether it's uh, uh, you know, you know, New York Times cooking, or, yeah. you know, you're looking for a quick recipe, like what is it that goes into a, you know, an aioli, which you go into like some basics and aioli yeah. being one of the basics. Um, and and I, I'm wondering, um, in, like wh why was it important for you to have some, to give context in these, in these recipes? Like I said, people get used to just scrolling down past the, uh, the the narrative to just like all right what is the thing just that get i need to the meat just get yes. to the meat of it yeah but I, the I mean, context but the context is important i would imagine I, i'm curious absolutely. to hear i i mean i think that's where like a lot of the things that i do are definitely based on classic things and i think it's it's about respect for those traditions and those cultures to really understand 
how they were born, how they were always designed to be eaten or cooked or whatever. And then from there, you can go off and tweak and, and whatever. But um, to me, that's part of the joy of cooking is um, learning about different cultures, learning about how different people do things, because um, it can teach you something, not just about cooking, but about life, I think. There's something that you said that I think goes into that is when you're creating a dish for the first time, you have to have an idea for how you want it to turn out. And yeah. I think that those introductions help you help you understand what yeah. you're shooting for, not just physically to look at, but the flavors you're going for, the emotions it's supposed to elicit, the smells that are supposed to be coming out at which time in the kitchen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's it, right? Like you don't really, sometimes you read these titles for these recipes and you have no idea what it's going to taste like. So I try to put in like some um, little bits of information that'll give you more of that idea. Like for example, I think I have a recipe for like a spaghetti with cauliflower and pine nuts and currants, which is a very um, Sicilian thing to do to combine kind of like sweet and sour onions and pine nuts and currants. So that all those things mixed together. Um, but if you've never eaten something like that, it might sound really strange to you. So I talk a little bit about where that tradition comes from and how delicious all of that could be because it's one of my fav my favorite flavor combinations. Tell me about the, the look on your face, on your mom or dad's face when you made a dish like that, uh, whether whether they visited Sydney or whether it was when you were here. What, what, what was the reaction? You well, they probably say, oh, well, you know, Cubans do that too. We put raisins in the in the picadillo, which is basically <laughs> the same thing. So, um, no, they're funny. I think currants picadillo. You know, I can yeah, see it. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same. <laughs> they got it from the Cubans. Um, <laughs> they, they're very. Um, they they love a lot of my cooking, especially my pasta. So it's one of the things that I get requested the most when I go home. Um, actually, recently my mom was calling me to um, walk her through. Uh, carbonara, which she was on the phone with me while we were making it. And I kept saying, like, put the phone down. You need both your hands. But she <laughs> um, she says it wasn't the same as when I made it last time I was home. But, you know, it never is. But anyways, we try. <laughs> well, that's good. You got to get one of those little video screens so that she, she can have, you that's can both right. have your hands free. Yeah, that's right. So tell me a little bit about, um, you know, the, you want folks to use this as a as a special as a, a special meal type of of um, of cookbook. But you have some basics in there that I think are worth uh, talking about. Which you have. Tell me about some of your favorite recipes in the book. Stuff that 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 really exudes something that you've learned, and even maybe something that even you like making that you're yeah. really glad is in there. Well, I talk a lot about. Um, pastry. So a flaky pastry, um, I think that you can make beautiful like open faced rustic galettes on. It's something that I'm kind of known for here in Sydney. We do them at the, rest at the restaurant really often and people just rave about the pastry. So I, I try to teach you all how to do that through the book. Um, it's, it's a little tricky. It's hard to put into words sometimes the feeling of all of the in intricacies of making a really beautiful dough. But I do think that's one worth attempting because it's literally a base for anything. Like you can make it savory, you can make it sweet, you can use any fruit, you can use any vegetables pretty much. Um, and then have that as something, a really beautiful lunch or as part of a dinner buffet or something like that. Um, like I said, the pastas, are amazing. There's a very simple recipe for a very basic tomato and basil sauce um, that has butter. It's essentially those three ingredients, but it's one of my favorite things when it's summertime and the um, tomatoes are really excellent. And another one that I think is really worth trying for, you know, Thanksgiving's coming up. It would be a beautiful dish to have at Thanksgiving is a whole stuffed pumpkin. So I hollow out a pumpkin and then layer it with mushrooms and Gruyere cheese and like some day old sourdough with a bit of stock and you bake that whole thing whole. So when it comes out of the oven, the pumpkin's beautifully browned on the outside, but you can scoop into it and, and get this beautiful mushroom cheesy business, or you can cut it into a wedge and serve that at a dinner table. I think it would be quite striking. That is amazing. And I, actually I'm, I'm thinking of doing that with a, uh, with a, uh, como se llama? 
a, um, a Latin calabaza. Can we do that with a, with a calabaza? Go. I think you totally could. You could use what you have. Use what you right, have. right. Although yeah. I think I, st I think we still have the, the Halloween pumpkin that we never carved. So I'm going to put that on my list. Things <laughs> to try. It could work. It could work. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, tell me a little bit about um, how how the the writing of the book uh, changed your perception of cooking because there's a lot of things that in other words, what did you do when you were putting together the book that you had never really thought about uh, in well, the course of your career? I mean, writing recipes in general is challenging for someone who's not used to writing things down, who's very much, you know, I cook with, I had a little bit of this, I think I taste it, I think, oh, it needs a little bit of that. So I think trying to really nail down a formula for certain things is really important. And also understanding that seasonality means different things to different people depending on where you live and although i have a lot of things in the book that you would probably need to go to a farmer's market to find um i've also tried to slip in a few things that you might be able to find just at the normal grocery store because it, it, i don't want it to feel like something that is inaccessible because you don't live somewhere where there's farmers markets and and all this huge availability of seasonal produce you can still swap in other things to replace something that you can't find um but but i i do want to try to encourage people to go out and find those things because i think the flavor benefit of a lot of those things um you, you wouldn't be able to imagine and it supports your local community what, what are some of the flavors that you had for the first time at some point where you were like it just kind of turned on a different part of your brain well, Meyer lemons was one of them. Um, I think a Meyer lemon is some, something like a cross between an orange and a lemon. And I had that for the first time in California. And we would like slice them and chop them up and eat them just like that. You know, a lemon to me was always something you squeeze on. Maybe you, you use the microplane and got a little bit of the zest. But to chop up the whole thing and mix it into something was, I couldn't believe that you could use things like that. So little things like that. I want to be able to like, you know, turn people onto these different ideas of, of how you can use ingredients a little bit differently than you might have always been shown. Right. You mentioned your your galettes and someone mentioned it in the in the in the text here that they love making your apple galette. And, oh great. Uh, yeah. So I, I and I'm curious, so you know, I, as as a good Cuban girl, I, I imagine you must have you must make some killer pastelitos then. <laughs> Well, actually, I did make some in California once using, um, rather than using guava, we used um, quince, uh, like a membrillo we made out of, a, um, out of the quince. And I remember making a pastry filled with that and a little bit of cream cheese, like, like un pastelito de guayaba queso. And, and everyone was like, oh my God, I can't believe how delicious this is. And, um, and I taught them then, we found guavas, I taught them how to make guava paste. And I think it was one of those things that really opened up, you know, the Californians eyes to <laughs> this beautiful tropical produce. Well, that's one thing about Miami, I think that you find here that you don't necessarily find uh, in a lot of places, the tropical produce. I guess. I guess if you yeah. go really like Baja California, then you then you could find some of those well, things. But in in Australia, you can find a lot of it too, because Northern <laughs> Australia is gets quite tropical. So we have a lot of. Um, I like. I can find a lot of those things. The plantains are not the same. I don't know why. I don't know what kind of things they grow here, but they're not quite the same. So I do miss those from back home for sure. Is there something that you still make that that uh, that when you have a hankering for home, something that you make that is totally out of the chefy ballpark that is just like? Well, I do make picadillo on occasion, and it's so funny because I think as a kid, like picadillo was the thing that every time it came around, it was like, oh, this again. But now <laughs> I like, I love it. I I gotta have it like at least once a month. I think I make a picadillo. I. I've tried making my mom's black beans, but the beans that I get here are not the same and, and it's just never tastes right. So I've given up on that. All right. So uh, picadillo is like meatloaf, is like a ragu, is <laughs> right? Like every, yeah. in, in every household, it's different. So tell us your picadillo. Tell us what goes into it. So and I do the classic sofrito. Um, I do um, the onions, um, the peppers, the tomato 
a little bit of white wine. You know, my mom would always use the vino seco, the that, that yes. terrible wine. For yes, the terrible yeah. vino seco. Terrible, terrible. <laughs> so, anyways, I use white wine, um, but then I do um, I do the grounds beef, or, and, and honestly, sometimes I use pork, um, just depending on what I have. Um, but I add a little bit of like a beef stock and I add some spices. So I do put in like the cumin, I put in a little bit of cinnamon and, um, and let that just simmer down. And then I, at the end, um, I will add in like some, some little raisins, some olives, cause I love that. And, and always over white rice has to be white rice. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so like you're, <laughs> so you're pro raisin. Yeah, I'm pro raisin. I don't think I was as a kid, but I've been converted, and and I'm pro raisin. <laughs> See, I, I have this argument the whole t all the time. If you don't if you don't add raisins to your picadillo, what are you even doing? You're making a chili, basically. Like I know it's a, it's a, it's a chili. It's not anything special, right? I, that's how, now that's how I feel about it. But I don't think I said that when I was a kid. I think as a kid, my mom would like pick them out for us and put them in hers and my dad. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. I gotta, I gotta make mine with the raisins, and I tell the kid, "Look, you don't like them, you you can pick them out." That's yeah, totally <laughs> that's right, the but deal. It's going in. <laughs> um, well, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, you you mentioned the the recipes that you are thinking about this time of year. So, uh, are there any recipes that remind you of your youth? Stuff that like you put in there because they are special to you. Stuff that's that. Well, I think that idea of sofrito and the smell of that is something that can like instantly take me back to being a kid standing next to my mom in the kitchen so um there is a recipe for like a corn it almost tastes like tamal en cazuela but it's using fresh corn um so i make a sofrito base and i add in some corn fresh off the cob which in summer is so gorgeous and sweet um, and then I just blend up a little bit like in a food processor and add it back into the other half. And it just makes the most delicious like base for something like seared scallops or cooked prawns or uh, sorry, shrimp um, and, or something like that. And that is one of those flavors that is just like takes me back to being a kid. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's some questions here already on the board. So I want to ask some of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, I see. Uh, how is the Cuban, how is the cuisine in Australia influenced your own cooking? That's uh, Caroline that asked that question. Oh, so 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 much. I would say that um, because I am such a try to be such a champion of local produce, you really have to be able to connect with what's here. So um, the seafood here is absolutely amazing. And Sydney, luckily, is the center for a lot of the seafood industry. So we get things here that, you know, I've never seen anywhere else, like incredible crabs, um, all kinds of different fin fish. So I, I've really had to learn a lot about cooking and preparing seafood in a way that I didn't in the U.S. Um, but aside from that, a lot of the fruit and veg is the same. So I've really been able to like use that as my base and then from there start incorporating a lot of the the more native ingredients as well, which can be really interesting to use because they just add these flavors that, you know, you've never tried before. A lot of like the um, indigenous Australian culture uses those ingredients as part of their cuisine. And now luckily they're more available to chefs so we can start integrating that into the, the restaurant food. Uh, give me an example of that. What are some of those uh, some of those ingredients and, and or dishes that you're making that are that are typical uh, indigenous food? So, so there's a, one ingredient in particular called wattle seed, which is um, it has such an interesting flavor. It tastes like coffee and chocolate, but it's really really hard. So, so we crack that and we mix that into an ice cream, um, and it's a wattle seed flavored ice cream. It goes great with chocolate, obviously. Um, other things like um, lemon aspen, which is, it's not a lemon, it's like a little bud of a, of a flower, but it has a very, very intense citrus flavor. So we've used that for marinating and curing fish. Um, I think we've also used it in pastry as well. But a lot of these things, you only need like a little bit of it because it can really take things over. Um, they're just so strong and powerful. So that's been really cool for me to be able to learn while cooking over here. You know, that 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 reminds me of this um, uh, w one of those uh, chef's table shows where a guy added these uh, I, I want to say it was in Peru, added these uh, toasted ants 
that yeah. when you add have a lemony flavor to them. Acidity. Yeah, they, acidity. well, they use um, green ants here in a lot of cooking. I, I mean, that's not something that we do at Fred's, but a lot of restaurants do. And um, I have had um, green ant flavored gin. That is something that is made over here. And I would have you know, it. I, I, would, I would have that. It's good. The gin is good. There's a lot of things that I I, I probably am not quite daring enough to do, but um, I'll, I'll have the green ant gin. <laughs> All right. Well, wait, wait. What what's still on your to do list on your on your how to become an Australian list? What's on the list? <laughs> you know the true well, Australian yet, unless you I, have. Probably, I should take up surfing if I wanted to be a true Australian, but I'm pretty scared. I mean, I don't know. the The ocean is a lot rougher out here. It's not like. You know, we used to go to the beach in Key Biscayne where the water was, you know, totally flat. So I go in the water here and, and A, it's freezing and B, you know, there's always sharks around. So I'm uh, I'm a little bit hesitant for that one. There's a, the, the, the beaches are a lot like uh, California Pacific beaches where yep. they're ice cold and very yeah. rough and very big. Yeah. And there's a there's a place on I want to say is it ba Bondi Beach that's like yeah. a pool that that uses ocean water. So people go swimming a, in this ice cold. Yeah, they do lap in this a, ice cold. a rock pool, and that's a very Australian thing. All of these beaches that have like a, you know, like a cove, they'll carve out pools into the rock on the side, and then the the current fills the pool. Um, they'll also drain it every now and then uh, when the current goes out. But it's it's such a beautiful thing here. Like uh, it's the beach is kind of this like unifying place in Australia where you find, you know, everyone next to each other side by side. I mean, socially distanced, hopefully, but <laughs> you find all different kinds of people together on the beach. And, and a lot of people will start their day that way, you know, 6 a.m. They're in the freezing cold ocean swimming and then they get up, get, get, take a shower, go to work. Like it's really a part of the daily life and the ritual here, which I adore. I live, um, a 10 minutes walk from the beach where I am now. And, and it's very special. And, and I was going to say, that's something that, that, you know, Sydney and Miami have in common, that the beach yep. is such a big part of our experience, our daily experience, even though, you know, we, we may not get out there all the time, but we like yep. knowing that it's there. That's right. I mean, the connection to water and to the ocean is, is one of those things that I didn't really realize about Australia when I came. I probably still had a little bit of that like very misplaced crocodile Dundee <laughs> idea of, of what this country really was, what the heart and soul of this country was. But, you know, most of the country is not populated except for along the coast. And there's some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Like you, you can go to these incredible beaches not far out of major cities and be the only person there, um, which is really wild. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the difference in seafood because um, I, I remember one of the things that, that stood out to me is my like my first day in Sydney we went over to that big fish market yeah, uh, yeah that's the right fish in market. and like yeah. the uni is like it's it's like shrimp cheap it's like dirt cheap yeah. because they're well, just coming the, off huge boats the uni is the lobster is not the lobster is very uh, expensive but um, right? yeah no there's there's all kinds of different crabs as well like we have something called a mud crab which there's a photo of that in the book um which is you know the australians call them muddies which is a very bad name for them they're very sweet and delicious um and but their accent makes it sounds their accent yeah. makes it sound better gotta have the muddy okay exactly um so many uh prawns different kinds of prawns they do call them prawns here but they're they're so delicious um Spanner crabs, uh, there's fish like they're called um, flathead fish, which is like the typical fish used for your fish and chips. And then another one that I think I my family found really interesting when they came here was um, they're called bugs, but they're like mini lobsters. The other name is slipper lobster, which I think sounds a little bit better, but they have these like totally flat heads. They look really weird, like alien, but um, they're delicious as well. And that you'd only find here. That's kind of like a kind of like a langoustine or like a like a something like, a, like that, yeah. A mud bug, yeah. as they call them in, yeah. in Louisiana, <laughs> crawfish. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so here's those mud. Here are those those mud oh, crabs. Oh, that's the crab. Yeah, that's the crab. There yeah. you go. That's one of the yeah. mud crabs. 
Um, <laughs> somebody says here, we love bugs. <laughs> <laughs> That's my sister. <laughs> yeah, she loves those. <laughs> and uh, so, but, but now the kind of the kind of seafood that you get here in Miami is so different from that. Um, what was that like for you to to kind of experiment with this whole new range of fauna? Uh, to uh, yeah, it was it was really like going back to basics, and you know, like being the leader of a kitchen, people are looking at me to answer all these questions and to know all this stuff. So you really have to take a bit of a a humble pill and realize that, uh, you know, there's still so much I want to learn as well. I haven't, I'm, I definitely never say that I've, I've learned as much as I'm going to learn and that's it. Like, I think that's, that's the great thing about being in my position is that I still get to learn every day and we're able to get so many beautiful things in, um, that are still new to me now. Um, and then it's about, kind of distilling it down to its essence, trying to find the best way to cook it to make it really, really shine as much as it could. Um, and then from there, just making something delicious. But I think that is also the beauty of having like an open mind to things. Cause I, I'm not coming to this place with years of a chef telling me, this is how you do this. I'm kind of always coming at things like, this is new to me. I don't know what to do with it. Let's just break it down and see what it tastes like and, and have a play really. You know, one of the things I found when I was in Sydney is I found it uh, th the same way that you that here you walk around and hear Spanish just always in the background. You yeah. you don't get that there. You get you get different Asian languages in the background, and um, and and uh, so I was curious, like, uh, what do, what do people make of you when they talk to you and they hear about your background and. Well, I think everyone, you know, it's kind of it's intriguing. Like people don't understand sometimes. You know, I get a couple of Cubans that come in the restaurant, not recently because we don't have people traveling, but they come straight for me and they're like, we heard that you were Cuban and they started speaking to me in Spanish. And then everyone in the restaurant is like, oh my God, why is this girl, like how is she speaking Spanish? Cause, That's a very um, Cuban thing to do, by the way. It's a very Cuban thing, like to find the one Cuban in the city yeah. <laughs> and go and find them and talk to them. So yeah, it, I mean, you know, like anything, right? It's it's um i have a different background but so many of the people i work with have different backgrounds so it's cool for me to be able to come here with that same understanding and knowing what it's like to be a foreigner in a foreign place although you know australia is not that foreign but it allows me to connect with a lot of my chefs for example um you know that come from all different parts of the world and and i love that we all learn about each other through the food that we cook at our staff meal and um everyone brings something new to the table so so that part's really cool oh very cool um i we got some other questions here someone asks um uh, oh sylvie laria lariu who is who i work with at the herald and who you know apparently oh uh, uh, no kidding yes Hi, did. I guess you, did you guys go to school together <laughs> we did yeah i think she was you one go. year younger than me in school yeah well she wants to know number one are you team pastelito or team croqueta which I think is the most <laughs> very important. No, I'm both. How could I pick one? I, we'd go to the bakery and it would be, we'd get the croquetas and we'd get the pastelitos. And I'm definitely a fan of the croqueta preparada. I used to love the sandwich with smat, with the smash croquetas. That was one of my favorites. Very cool. What, what's, what's your go-to Cuban place in, when you're in Miami? Um, well, I think, you know, every time I, I want to go to Versailles, my mom is like, oh, no, I'll make it at home. But I, I just love the energy, <laughs> you know, the yep, kids that's are like, we do it better. Um, but I, I do love going to Versailles and just people watching. I, I just love the, you know, the little, the window, the coffee window. And we used to go to the Oasis a lot in Key Biscayne. Sure, I don't even know sure. if it's still there, but it, they had I think some it of my recently favorites. closed. It recently oh, really? closed. Yeah, oh, yeah. But, but, but yes, their, that's a favorite. Their mariquitas. We would buy bags of them and go to the beach and, and just have mariquitas on the beach. That was so good. Um, and, you know, where else? Oh, Latin America. Like there's a Latin America right by my parents' house, and, and we'd go there often. That's one of the El original. De las Fritas. On yeah, it is. right on Coral Way yeah. and almost yeah. 20, 20 something or so. Yeah, that's the one. That's the yeah. one. Yeah, the original. Um, and there's Rey de las Fritas, of course. So, uh, another great spot for people watching. 
Yes, for sure. I see. I'm. I'm. Uh, I love Ray. I'm Team Mago. Mago de la Frita okay. because I, yeah, I'm close right? to them. Okay. I'm close to them. So I'm Team Mago. And, uh, <laughs> okay. and actually, one of the folks on the chat here is uh, Ana Sofia Pelaez, uh, yes. who is uh, who also wrote one of my favorite. Who wrote one of my favorite cookbooks? One of my very kitchen stained cookbooks. Um, yeah. Uh, the Cuban Table, and she wants to know what do you wish we could ship to you from Miami. Oh my God. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Ana Sofia. And yeah, we did, my grandmother helped me write a recipe for that book for the Butifarra. Um, oh, so you, really? You can go tell back and look at that. Us, yeah. Yeah. Tell us, that. Um, tell us about that recipe. Well, I remember, um, she asked me to, um, to contribute a recipe and I was so honored. I was living in California and, um, I spoke to my grandmother about it and I think we decided to, to do the butifaja, which is like a, a you know a handmade sausage, because um, it was a bit different, not something that I've seen a lot of Cuban households make, but it's one of those like traditional things that I, I don't think should be lost. So I really wanted to like recreate that and give it a go, and and so we wrote that recipe um, in the book. And I'm still every time I open up that book, it just makes me so happy to see that. Oh, um, that's so great. But what could you ship to me? Well black beans, <laughs> even Ooh. just dry, dried black beans would be great. And Badia Completa Sazon, which I know has MSG <laughs> in it now, yes. but I can't find it. I can't find it. I miss it so much. And it is that thing. I think that's why my Cubans would never taste the same here because I don't have it. Yeah. Sazon Completa is, is like, yeah. a, it's, it's an essential ingredient. Essential. I think. In, in yeah. Cuban tasting or Miami Cuban tasting. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, black beans. That's right. Um, let's see what other questions we have in here. Um, uh, it says, uh, do you celebrate Noche Buena in Australia? Well, usually not because I'm usually working. Um, of course. Yeah, I, um, I'm always at the restaurant on big holidays these days, unless I go home. Now, I've, I've lived here six years, and I think I've made it home for about three of those Christmases. And I always make sure that I'm there either just before or on the day of Noche Buena because it is probably one of my favorite family gatherings and meals ever. I mean, if someone asked me what my like death row meal would be, it would probably be the the lechong, my mom's beans, some white rice, the you know, the boiled yuca and mojo, you know, all the classics. I love it so much. I think you have to make a a, a caja china lechong for your people in uh well, in, in I would, do you know that I actually have because they they have imported some and I made them here once on a TV show and and this was like years ago and you made and a now I see them. pig I did, on a TV I show did, in Australia. I did. I did. Oh, that's and, um, and then they started popping up everywhere, which is really cool. So I'm happy that um, that people here have really embraced it. And you know now they start cooking. They're cooking lambs in them. They're doing all these different things. Um, but that's beautiful. I mean, the caja china is such a such a Cuban Miami thing to me. For sure. Now, the next thing they got to put it in is a kangaroo. I was. Uh, yeah. I was <laughs> they got to make a big one. <laughs> I was surprised to go to like the equivalent of a Walgreens and they sell packs of kangaroo jerky. Yeah, kangaroo so, like, jerky. What's I mean, experience? it's common. It's common. What's your experience with cooking kangaroo? Well, do you know, I actually made kangaroo um, empanadas once for like some big festival or something that they asked that me to cook. Amazing. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, and it was, you know, they were good. People really loved them. Uh, yeah, of course they were good. <laughs> once, once you add in all the seasoning and stuff, it tastes, you couldn't probably tell the difference between that and beef. But um, it, that and wallaby, which are just like smaller kangaroos, like those animals are, um, they really recommend that more people eat them because they can be seen as quite a pest. So it's part of like the culling process means, you know, it's not just going to waste, but you can turn it into food. Um, and um, people love it. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I, I was surprised by that, how kangaroos, like they outnumber, they outnumber people in Australia, something like yeah. 10 to one, something like that. It's wild. Yeah. It's wild. They're everywhere. Like, you know, when my family came here um, several years ago, we did a little bit of a of a road trip, and um, my niece and my nephew, who I hope are watching, Charlie and Mia, um, one of the first things we saw when turning outside of the airport in the car 
was a roadkill kangaroo and oh. I, we were just all oh, we were so <laughs> horrified like these poor kids that was like their first <laughs> visual on a live kangaroo but luckily when we got to our destination they saw lots of beautiful ones hopping around in the background so it was okay oh well now we know what we'll, <laughs> we'll be talking about in therapy in a few years yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um, yeah. Let's see, what are the questions that we have here? And folks can feel free to chime in. Um, uh, uh, with Thanksgiving around the corner, what's your favorite way to prepare a turkey and what sides are non-negotiable on your table? Well, sadly, Thanksgiving is not celebrated in Australia and that makes me really unhappy because I do love Thanksgiving in the States. But um, roasting the turkey, I do really love brining turkey. I don't go to that trouble with um, with chickens or really any other poultry, but because of the size of them and the nature of the turkey breast, um, always getting dry, no matter what you do, cooking it whole, um, brining is pretty essential. Um, and then just a simple roast in the oven. But I like to put a bit of time into making a beautiful gravy, which is totally essential. Um, so I'll take the turkey neck, I'll even ask the butcher for like excess turkey wings and I'll brown them off and make a beautiful stock with that and then strain it. And then in the same pan that I've taken the turkey off of, I, I just remove all the vegetables or any aromatics that I've had in there and put some butter and some flour to make a little roux, pick up all the little bits from the pan and then slowly add in some of that uh, turkey stock and then let it bubble and thicken and then just strain it and serve it with a turkey that is essential. Um, what other essentials do I love? Um, yeah, what sides do you love? Because, you know, sometimes a uh, Cuban Thanksgiving can, can bring in stuff that's yeah. not traditionally there, but well, well what I, stuff yeah, do I, you love? I, I don't love the whole, like, Cuban, like throwing in the rice and the black beans with the turkey. <laughs> I do like the traditional, more American sides. Um, I love like a spinach or a greens gratin. So kind of same thing. You make a little bit of a roux and then add in milk um, and then um, garlic and onions and things like that. And then some spinach leaves or some rainbow chard or something like that. Layer that into a dish and then some cheese on top and baked in the oven so it gets like brown and bubbly. Is uh, one of my favorites. I, I'm a, I actually love a good old roasted potato as opposed to a mashed potato. That's probably controversial, but um, <laughs> I like to just boil potatoes whole until they're tender, take them out, cut them um, into pieces, and then roast them for a while, like a good long time in the oven with lots of clarified butter and salt and thyme until they get super, super crispy. Um, and those would probably be always on my Thanksgiving table. All right, right on. Yeah. Um, someone, someone asked here also. Have you been able to find good Cuban food in Sydney? Nope. I'm guessing no. <laughs> Any Cuban food, probably only if you made it. Unequivocal. I'm saying no. I haven't. <laughs> what What has become comfort food for you when you're there? Is there anything? Is um, there any place that you go out to that, like, when you don't want to cook, that you go out to that's that's become comfort food for you? Yeah, I would say, um, like. Chinese food, you know, like dumplings and things have become Chinese food or like a really good pho, which is like a Vietnamese soup with noodles and delicious broth. Um, interestingly, like it's just so easy to find great examples of all of that food. So I would say that when, you know, I don't want to cook and it's a Sunday afternoon, like, you know, we go to our local Chinese restaurant and, and have delicious dumplings. And that's one of my favorite things. And and folks should know that that some of the probably some of the best Chinese food outside of China in the world you guys get there because it's it's that bridge between between cultures there. You, it's a yeah, meeting place for de it. Definitely, and there's a lot of um, chefs that trained in Hong Kong that have come back to Australia and opened up Chinese restaurants here. And and not you know they don't have to be anything. They're nothing fancy, but they're just those super delicious, really well made, really authentic flavors. And someone asked here, uh, when are you opening a restaurant in Miami? And I guess the question is, what would it take for you to think about <laughs> coming back to Miami and opening a restaurant? Well, you never know. I'm always throwing it out there, but um, we'll see. I mean, who knows what the future could hold? I, I, I'm so encouraged every time I go to Miami about all the great new restaurants that I see and like young people opening restaurants with their own ideas about how things should be. And I think that's part of like, building momentum and really attracting 
like-minded people, you know, back to a certain place. Like, you know, when I left Miami, I, 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 I've always loved it there and that's where my family is. But in terms of like food and cuisine, because I didn't have so much of that connection to the farm, to the place, to the land, that was something that I really wanted to try and find and learn about in California. But now I see so much of that happening in Miami, which is really exciting. Um, and that's probably, that will be one of the major things that would contribute to me coming back to open a restaurant. You know, speaking of restaurants, I mean, obviously there, we're in a situation now uh, here in the U.S. We just had the largest number of daily cases of coronavirus and it's and every day is a new record. Uh, I think yeah. it was I want to say it was like one hundred and forty thousand new cases. And I think Australia has been kind of a model for getting it under control, even though it caused some rest, a lot of the economy to really to, to stagnate and to freeze. Uh, but you guys had something like seven cases like yeah it's you know been, but what's I that been really, like for you uh, r running well, a, you know running a restaurant with that situation you yep know? i feel really fortunate to have been here working in a restaurant during this time because i do think that we've been really really lucky um but um i i think everyone has had to be a lot more adaptable in this time you know you've had to space out your tables differently um we take everyone's name at the front door and we um it's all part of like contract contact tracing um so it has not been too bad here so i feel really fortunate but even then we still had to do things a lot differently we did close for about three months and then shifted to doing food at home which was uh, interesting. Um, I was, to be honest, happy to have a bit of a slowdown because um, I've been just kind of at a furious pace for the last several years. So I didn't mind that as much, but um, it's still can I can imagine have been super isolating for a lot of people. So um, I'm, I'm thankful that it wasn't as bad here. And, you know, we've been able to bring back a bit of normalcy. And I just hope that it stays that way. That's great. Uh, yeah. Tell me about some of the home delivery. What do you? What did you guys do over there? What are the home cooking? What? Did, how? How did that? How did that play out? We did. Um, we did a lot of food that was like from the restaurant. So the group that um, owns Fred's has lots of different restaurants, and they each kind of produce their own like kit. So so these were dishes that you would take and finish cooking at home, um, and and we would change the menu like every couple of weeks to give people a little more interest. But, you know, I was doing like cannelloni filled with pumpkin and sage when it was a bit colder. Um, you know, right now we're still doing it, actually. So that's co continued to be something that people really want. But um, fresh made pastas with beautiful pasta sauces that get delivered to your door. And, you know, you just cook up the pasta, finish it at home. So I think a lot of people still are not going out quite as much, um, especially some people in the more like vulnerable category. So um, that's a really great option for people that aren't dining out these days in, in Australia. Well, it's a perfect time to like say, I don't know, grab a cookbook, like, I don't know. Yeah, uh, there you I'm go. Sure a, I know, sure I do a think cookbook that, that uh, <laughs> someone could buy that would keep them busy. Uh, I think and quarantine has been has been great for cookbook sales. So <laughs> it's a good time to be coming out with a cookbook. Uh, well, tell us anything else. I mean, if, if folks uh, you know want to start asking some questions, I think I've you know I've, I've uh, bloviated enough. I'd love to hear from from folks, whether it's uh, your fans, your loyal fans, or folks out there who have any other questions. I would love to hear from them. Well, and I I'm. Um, I'm heading out to the restaurant as well. So I need to be shoving off. So if anyone has any last questions, um, ask away. I think, I think we no, had a, that it? I think, okay. I think that, I think that's it. We've had I a great chat. I didn't even realize what time it was. We sure have. Well, that was wonderful guys. Um, I think we, we got thank some you. questions in there. We got those answered, um, but that was great. Thank you so much, Daniela. Thank you, Carlos, um, thank to everyone. You. To everyone watching at home, uh, if you're on Crowdcast, you can press the green button below to order your copy of Always Add Lemon. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can head to our website where we have um, a search button and you can search for Always Add Lemon and we'll ship it to you to your house. So I'm I'm hungry after that. So I'm going to go have yeah. some dinner. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you. 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 Th
thank you, Carla. Thank you, Books and Books. And buy the book from Books and Books. Support your yes, independent Yes, yes. Support your independent <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys.